Lord God, you've given us another week um, to, to be here and to learn from you and to read your word. And among the many things that you've blessed us with are just the eyes to see, the ears to hear, the mind to understand, and the heart to receive. And right now, I ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon this room right now, that everyone here will just be able to clear their minds from everything that has been preoccupied, has their minds preoccupied, whether it be work issues, school issues, um, let that all fade away for now, Lord. You are providing a way and you will provide a way to resolve those issues. But right now, just open the hearts and minds of everyone here, Lord. Let us see your beauty and your majesty and your glory through what we're about to, to look at today. Use me as well, Lord, as your instrument. And may I bring you the glory that only belongs to you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. One of one of my favorite one of my favorite apps comes to getting my study together. One of my favorite apps on my phone is, is the 1828 Bible, I mean, 1828 Dictionary. Um, it's a little bit different than the Webster's, Merriam-Webster Dictionary I have. Um, I like going through it and looking at a specific word because back in 1828, they just had a different way of defining it. And sometimes, um, it has a more, I want to say, better way that our modern-day dictionaries may put that word. And uh, and so, yeah, you know, when I do these studies, um, I want to see what maybe how that word was was mentioned or how it was looked at back in eighteen in the, in the nineteenth century. And one of the words that we're going to be looking at today, one of the things that we um, one of the, main themes we'll, we'll be studying today is, is manifestation, the word manifestation. And I wanted to find out what that word, how that word was defined in the 1820 edition. And this is how manifestation was defined as. It says, the act of disclosing what is secret, unseen, or obscure. Discovery to the eye or to the understanding. The exhibition of anything by evidence. So in other words, it's a sign that shows something clearly. This morning, as we finish chapter six uh, in Mark, uh, we'll be reading about an instance where the glory of God was manifested by Jesus. And also we'll be looking at a story where more and more people's faith in Jesus manifested into miraculous healing. What we, what we discover this morning is that Jesus always, he always has our best interests in mind. He knows exactly when and where to make the most impact in order for us to easily recognize his divine power and glory. So um, if you're there in Mark chapter 6, we're going to be picking up, I'm going to, again, as I usually do, I'm going to read certain sections and then talk about it and and see how it applies to our lives. So in Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 45, we read, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, while he dismissed the crowd, after he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them being battered as they rode because the wind was against them. Around three in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the sea, and wanted to pass them by. 
This morning's passage begins by telling us that Jesus immediately made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Now, again, I'm, I'm the type of person that likes to, I'm a visual learner and I, was, I had to find out what, 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 he, what we're talking about specifically or where we're talking about specifically. So I have a map here around the city of Galilee. Um, most of the, a lot of times his ministry, main ministry during this time, during the beginning here, was in Capernaum. Um, what we come to, what, what a lot of scholars believe, and what I believe as well, is that during the feeding of the 5,000, they were on their way to, to the area of Bethsaida. So they, they were looking for a quiet uh, place to, to meet and to fellowship. And so it might have been around this region here, somewhere in between. Capernaum and Bethsaida that they landed and, and where Jesus had fed the 5,000. So what we find out here in our verse, in the beginning of this verse, is that Jesus, after they were done, Jesus immediately tells his disciples, okay, get into the boat and go to Bethsaida, and I basically I'll meet you there. And so this is what, this is the area now he's telling them, okay, this is where we're, we're heading out to. Um, and we'll come back to the map in just a minute again. This event we're about to look at is what followed right after the disciples had picked up the 12 baskets full of leftover bread and fish. Now, rather than allowing the disciples to rest and continue on together the following morning, Jesus tells his disciples, okay, like I said, get into the boat and go ahead of him, and, to, and tells them to, to go ahead of him. Reading verse 45 makes you kind of wonder, why didn't he go with them? I mean, what was the rush? Why was... Why was why is it immediate? Again, why not wait till the next morning? Well, we're giving two reasons in verses 45 and 46. The first reason was that he wanted to personally dismiss the crowd and say his goodbyes. See, Jesus really had a heart for those he served. He really cared about them. So he didn't just want to abruptly get up and say, okay, see you later, bye, we're, I'm heading out. No, he was like, he, he knew that the disciples were you know, they were personally tired, and after, after the work that he did, after the work that they did in ministry, that they, uh, that they, they, they did there with the 5,000, the crowd of 5,000, but he wanted to stay there. He wanted to stay there with the crowd to just say, hey, you know what, man, I, I love you, I care about you, and, and, and maybe perform some, some healing miracles and drive out demons. And he wanted to say his farewell. He wanted to do a proper farewell. Farewell. Now, the other reason we see was that he wanted to spend time in prayer. It had been a long and physically exhausting day, meeting all these physical and spiritual needs of what, it may, what may have been 15 to 20,000 people. And how I get that number is a lot of scholars believe that um, these five, well, what we're told in, early on in, verse, in chapter 6 was that um, there were 5,000 people there, and in one of the other Gospels, I believe it was John, tells us that, or Matthew, that um, that wasn't counting the men and children, the women and children. So some scholars believe there was about 15 to 20,000 people there. So yes, it was a physically exhausting day for him. But regardless of how hard that day was, Jesus' exhaustion actually drove him to prayer, not to now, how many of us, how many of you will honestly admit that after a long and exhausting day at work or school, make an intentional effort to spend time in prayer? I mean, I know that it's challenging for me. It's, I, I, at times, I find this difficult as well. You know, and you know, there are times I come home at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning and, and, uh, and I just want to go straight to bed. Um, and it's hard, I know, even if, even if you don't have those hours. I see Robin sometimes come home and she's just like oh, I'm tired, you know. I, and her job is also physically demanding. But what Christ, Jesus Christ, shows us here is that physical exhaustion should not be an excuse to keep us from spending time with God. As difficult as may it may be at times, we must avoid looking at prayer as just another chore or a task that needs to be accomplished. I, I, I go back and I think about what Jesus did 
as he fed these 5,000. And yeah, just how physically exhausting that might have been. I mean, here he was, just ripping up bread after bread, fish after fish, and just handing it out to the disciples. We're talking about, again, for about 15 to 20,000 people. How physically exhausted do you think he was from doing that? But again, it drove him to prayer. He knew that he had to do that. He had to spend time in prayer. Now, when we look at prayer as a task or a chore that needs to be done or needs to be accomplished, that kind of thinking start to become legalistic, and that's not how God wants us to come to him. I wouldn't want any of my kids, I wouldn't want any of those who, 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 who I love to come to me and feel as though talking or spending time with him, with me, was just a, to- a chore or a task that they had to do. I want them to be able to come to me just because they want to. I mean, I do, I just, I do love it when, when uh, any of the kids in my comes to me and just wants to spend time. And it's not like, and, and, and it's never that feeling like, oh, man, I gotta go talk to my dad, and like, oh, I gotta go talk to Angel. No, it's one of those things where it's just, even though they're tired and exhausted, they know they can come to me. And that's how we should come to God as well. You know, not in a way like, okay, Lord, I'm gonna give this time to you, and well, I'm gonna tell you what's going on. No, it's not, it's not about that. He doesn't want that. Again, it's, that kind of thinking is legalistic. Not how, it's not how God wants us to come to him. Now, among the many benefits of prayer, and there are a lot of, so many benefits to prayer. And among the, among the many, one of them is that God provides the additional strength we need when we're physically exhausted. Here's what Isaiah 40, 28 to, 28 to 31 tells us about that. It says, he gives us strength he gives strength to the weary and strengthens the powerless. Youths may faint and grow weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. He gives us that, he provides that strength that we need when we're tired. Another benefit is that it provides the spiritual rest we need when that exhaustion is just more than physical. And you, I think you know what I'm talking about here too is, is sometimes you're just, it's more than just being physically tired. There's inside you're like, uh, you just want to rest as well and you're, you're exhausted. And, and I also know that feeling, especially when, when it comes to ministry. You know, sometimes you, you know, come back from serving and doing all this stuff and you're just like, oh, I don't want to do anymore. I'm just so tired and it's just too much. Prayer offers, again, that spiritual rest that we need. Listen to what Jeremiah 31.25 says. It says, For I satisfy the thirsty person and feed all those who are weak. I want to encourage you this morning. I, it's something I, you know, I, I pray for every time I think about for this, for all those that come here, is to make that intentional effort to take some alone time and pray. Whether it's, especially after an exhausting day, exhausting day, whether it's just pulling up into your drive, driveway and just spending a couple, turn off the radio, just turn off the car, or leave the air conditioning on, especially if it's on a hot day. <laughs> um, and just, just talk to the Lord and say, you know, just tell him, tell him, hey, Lord, tired, Lord, and it's been a hard day, and I just need you right now just to give me that strength that I need to, to feed the kids and to walk the dog and to um, do my homework or whatever it may be. Lord, just, I, I need you right now. I, give me that strength that only you can provide. And even after an exhausting day, at the end of the, at the, end of the day, when you're lying there in bed, I mean, I've heard a lot of preachers say, a lot of pastors and teachers say, hey, um, don't pray while you're laying down and because you're just going to fall asleep. But I'll tell you something. I would rather fall asleep with the Lord on my mind than the worries of this world on my mind. I would rather have 
prayer on the tips of my lip than to be thinking, oh man, how am I going to pay this bill? Or how am I gonna, what am I going to do here tomorrow? And, and this person needs that, and, and I need to sign this, and I need to sign that. And I mean, you know, it's okay. I think, I think it's okay to sometimes just lay there, especially at the end of the day, and just fall asleep with the Lord on your mind and on your lips. So I encourage you to make that intentional effort to take some time to pray. So now what we see in the next verses, in verses 47, 48, later on that evening, while Jesus was alone in prayer, the boat was out in the sea, and, and it says, it says that, in, that he noticed that they were being battered as they rowed because the wind was against them. According to John 6, according to, to John's gospel, in, in chapter 6, verses 18 to 19, a high wind had arose and the sea became rough. That's how John describes it. Now, it wasn't until 3 in the morning, and this was going on throughout the evening, throughout the, the all night, and, but it wasn't until 3 in the morning that Jesus, it, it says, we're, we're told here that it was at the, um, around, yeah, 3 in the morning. Some, some certain translations say, um, have a, a different way of putting it, and I, I can't think of it right now on top of my head, but um, around 3 in the morning, Jesus came walking towards them on the water, and it says that he wanted to pass them by. Now, again, I ask the question, why, what does that mean? What, how did he want to pass them by? I mean, did, was he trying to go somewhere else? Was he trying to beat them to Bethsaida? Was, I mean, what was the deal? Why pass them by? But as I continue to look at it, as I continue to study, um, it wasn't that at all. It wasn't that he was trying to you know, outrace them or outrun them. Rather, Jesus' intent in passing by, in passing by them, was that was so that they would see and understand that it was him. He was basically trying to get their attention. What Jesus was doing right before their eyes was manifesting his deity and his power. I want to read a quote to you that I read from John Corson. John Corson is an amazing Bible expositor. I love to hear him um, um, teach. Um, he's he's out of, I believe, out of California. I think it's Calvary Gate Christian Fellowship. I could be wrong, but um, great again, great teacher. Um, and he says this about that situation. He gives us great insight. How, is, how this applies to us. He says, Jesus sent his disciples into the sea where he knew a storm would be brewing. And in such a way, he works with us today. He blesses us and then allows us to go into the, into the midst of the storm. Why? Because he knows that storms will inevitably come into our lives without exception. And were, and were we not seasoned veterans of the storm, we would be blown away. And then what he goes on to say is that, is that in sending them into this storm, Jesus was actually developing their faith by preparing them for the storms that would come after his death by way of persecution. There's a story in Acts chapter 5 where the disciples, where 5,000 people had accepted Christ. And it was an amazing blessing, all these people being saved. And what happens immediately after that? They go into the storm of persecution. And they're being hunted. And they're being put into jail. In my own personal experience, and maybe yours as well, this has definitely been the case in my growth and in my development as a Christian. There have been times, there have been times I, I will see and experience the blessings of God. And then he allows me to go into a storm to equip and prepare me to handle the bigger storms. Let me give you a personal example of what I mean. In 2010, I rededicated my life to the Lord. I had walked away from the Lord for about for 10 years. 
in every decade of my life. I, was, I had hit my rock bottom. And I cried out to the Lord. And he rescued me. And I began to serve. And I began to, to be involved at, at, at the church I came from. And, and he was just doing an amazing work also in the life of my family. And in my life as well. Then, in 2012, because of the mis some of the mistakes I made, I was terminated from, from, from my job. And I remember thinking to myself, man, how devastating. And, and thinking, how am I going to provide for my family? And my wife wasn't working at the time. She was a student. And, and you know, I had a, a 10-year-old... Uh, What, seven? Six? Maybe? Maybe? Yeah, about seven years old. And Bella was just a tiny little baby. And yeah, one. Still my baby. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember thinking, how am I going to, how is, how am I going to, Lord, wow, come on. I, I, it was, it was affecting me. And I, and I realized that he was putting me into a storm. This is one of those storms that he was putting me into. And how I reacted, what I was going to do during the storm was going to determine how much growth, how much he was going to develop me. And, and it was going to, it made a, it was going to determine how I was going to continue walking as a Christian. This was a storm that God allowed me to go into. I'll tell you what, I, 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 I don't really have the time to really get into the full story about what happened as a result of it. Um, I could tell you that I, I ended up getting my family back and I did end up getting my job back and, and the Lord showed me a lot through it and I remained faithful and one of the things that he spoke to my heart about was, was that I had to now walk the talk. I can talk to I'm blue in the face about, you know, being a, you know, faithful Christian and walking through difficult times no matter what and but unless you've walked it unless you've been there and actually gone through a storm like that um, you don't know how hard it is and again maybe 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 a lot of you or you you guys have know what I'm talking about you've been there you've done that and you've experienced that but as a result what I one of the greatest things I learned is, my, is, is a complete dependence on God. I know now that if I was something was to happen and I was to lose my job, I know now that He will provide and I know that He will take care of us and I know that that even though it may seem like how this is all going to happen, I've seen Him work and I know that He will and He has and will continue to provide. I have no doubt about it. But had I not gone through that, I would have probably would still be freaking out that I could be losing my job and, you know, what this new administration that's coming in decides to get rid of us all. And there's so many people freaking out out there, like, about their jobs and how they, you know, that they just, they forget. God, again, is in control of every situation. In James chapter 1, he refers to these storms as trials. James refers to these storms as trials. And explains that these what these trials are meant to accomplish. If you've never read James chapter 1, or it's been a while since you've read it, go back to it and explains again what these trials are meant to accomplish. Paul in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, also says this about the afflictions we endure in the midst of these storms. He says, Affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. It's therefore important that you understand that when God sends you into a storm, there's a reason for it. It's, in, it's never to harm you. It's never to do anything horrible to you. It's never to um, punish you. His intention in going into these storms is to develop a stronger and deeper faith in Him. 
So when the waves of life are battering you, and you feel as though those strong winds of life circumstances are keeping you from rolling forward or moving forward, take a moment to look out. Take a moment to just stop what you're doing and look out. And somewhere out there, passing by, is Jesus. Somewhere out there, in the midst of that storm, he's out there walking on the water, trying to get your attention. Is waiting to see when you call out to him. He's there. Not far from you. He's just, again, just trying to get your attention. Well, it appears that by their reaction, Jesus has certainly gotten their attention. Let's read the next few verses. Starting in verse 49. When they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke with them and said, Have courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded, because they had not understood about the loaves. They had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. I remember the first time when I was a small little kid, that I saw one of my uncles uh, perform a magic trick. I was a, just a tiny little whippersnapper. Um, but I was you know, smaller, younger than, than Bella. And he did that trick of pulling that coin behind the ear. I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys have seen it and maybe someone's done it to you. But when I saw it, I was like, you know, I was like oh wow, look, 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 that's, how'd you do that? It's amazing. And, you know, I didn't, it was just shocking to me. I was like, do it again, do it again. You know, I was, in, I was, I was completely mesmerized. And it wasn't until, you know, once I figured it out, I got older, I figured out how it was done. It wasn't until um, I had kids of my own that I was like, I, 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 I want to just do the same thing. I want to be able to do something. I'm not a good magician. I'm not, I don't do these little tricks, but what I, I like to mess with them. I like to play with them. So one of the things, I don't know if, if, my, if my oldest remembers this, because I used to do it when he was a kid, was I would take like maybe a coin or something, a piece of candy that they had or wanted or something, and I would put it in my mouth and pretend that I had swallowed it, and they were like, oh, well, well, I will give it back to me, give it back to me. And I'd be like, no, I can't give it back to you, I swallowed it. And, and, I'd, be like, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, and then I'd be like, are you sure you want it back? They'd be like, yeah, yeah, I want it back. You know, and then I'll be like, you know, and then, like, you know, that's, I, I was weird like that. You know, I've always been weird like that. I just had a, a really um, unconventional, weird sense of humor. Um, but, uh, yeah, I had modified that trick to make it just a little bit closer. Just to give him that, you know, just give him that shock. Um, and again, I, they probably remember what I, you know, each one of them I, I would do. Um, so now when I used to, now when I had done it with Bella, he's, you know, my oldest would be like, whatever, you know? <laughs> but, uh, well, well what's, what my point is here is that what we see here is that Jesus wasn't doing a magic trick. Um, because there was no way that at that time that there was, that this could have been or would have been a magic trick. Yes, the reaction that the disciples had was, was, Similar in that it, they were in shock and they were mesmerized and they were terrified. But there was no way at all that this was a magic trick. I mean, today people have tried to replicate it and they use all kinds of technology and they'll try to use all kinds of you know ways, but this wasn't available during Jesus' time. And even if it was, I don't believe that Jesus was trying to hoax his disciples into doing something. You know, he wasn't trying to fool them, he wasn't trying to trick them. I mean, he genuinely cared for them and he wanted to, you know, he wanted to show, reveal himself and show himself to his disciples for who he really was. 
So if again, if I thought that pulling a coin from the back of my ear was shocking, the sight of Jesus walking on water would have completely freaked me out. Now I think most of us would agree that it had, if we had been on that boat with the disciples, our reaction probably would have been the same. Maybe for some people here, they probably would have fainted. I mean, you know, I don't know. Um, but walking on water, what a crazy sight to see. Now in their mental state of shock, it says they thought that what they saw was a ghost. And as a result, they cried out. And I think this is interesting, again, this topic, uh, I believe that in this time right now and in this season, as, as, we, as people go out and dress up in costumes to go out and get candy and, and all that, um, that, this shows up. This, this topic about a storm, I mean this topic, topic about a ghost. Now in the original Greek language, the word ghost refers to an apparition of a spirit. The fact that Mark mentions it here shows us that even in the Jewish culture, even within that community, the belief of ghosts was commonly known. However, the reaction to the apparition, to, to the apparition of a ghost, to any apparition of ghosts, were always terrifying. And the reaction again shows it. They, no one ever said that, hey, you know what? Oh, I see a ghost. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Hey, you know, it was, <laughs> it was always a terrifying thing. Now, I don't want to, without getting too much into it, I want to dispel a myth about ghosts by briefly explaining what the Bible has to say about it. There are a lot of things out there. There are good spirits and bad spirits and good ghosts and bad ghosts. And, you know, people come up to me and come up to me and do I believe in ghosts? And I think in a way, and I tell them, well, not in the way that you think. And I think I... I, I I would also apply this also when it comes to, to even UFOs and sightings in the sky and all that. But let me, uh, again, I, I want to talk about ghosts here for just a minute and t tell you what the Bible says about ghosts. Hebrews 9.27 says, and just, as is a, is just, and just as it is appointed for people to die once and after this judgment. The result of this judgment, when people die, there's judgment right away. The result of this judgment is heaven for the believer, and we see that explained in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and in Philippians chapter 1. And the other side of that is that there's judgment of hell for the unbeliever. And that's explained in Matthew chapter 20, 25 and in Luke chapter 16. There is no in-between. There is absolutely no in-between. When, when a person dies, Immediately, they either go to hell, waiting for that judgment from God that puts them into an eternal punishment with the devil and his angels, or that person goes to heaven and spends time with the Lord until he comes back, until he comes back for the rest of his saints. There is no in-between. The only type of spirit that we see in the Bible interacting and appearing in the physical world are angels and demons. Now these demons, demons were fallen angels that had rebelled against God and are evil, deceptive, and destructive. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 14 and 15 says that sometimes these demons disguise themselves by impersonating good angels and deceased human beings. What's the goal of this? What are these demons trying to accomplish? What are these evil spirits, these ghosts, trying to accomplish? They're trying to fool, distract, and prevent people from knowing the truth about God. They're just trying to distract people and say, uh, to, to, to make them believe and see something else or make them you know, turn away from the Lord trying to bring that fear into a person. That's why it's so important for you to know God's word. Know what it says in there. Know what, what God's word tells us about ghosts in the 
of evil spirits. There are no good evil spirits. They're all evil. They're all meant to, again, to distract you. There's nothing good about them. So be careful again. Be careful if someone tells you, I've seen a ghost, or, or if even if you imagine, or not imagine, but maybe you've even seen something. First understand that, yeah, they exist. And the other thing I want you to understand is they can't harm you. As a child of God, with the Holy Spirit inside you, they can't do anything to you. You're protected by the blood of Jesus. They can try to fear, they can try to put some fear into you and they can, can scare you. But by the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, they, they can't do anything to you. The more you understand the truth about God, the less likely demons will deceive you. But rather than leaving them, Rather than leaving them in that state of shock and terror, Jesus tells them, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. In their moment of fear, Jesus Christ reveals himself in an almost identical way. And as I studied, I saw this also. In an almost identical way that God revealed himself to the prophets and kings of the Old Testament. I encourage you look look that up. You know, look, look look do a word search in in your you know computerized Bibles or apps whatever and where you know just do a word search that says you know don't be afraid or fear not and and you'll see how many times God appeared to the prophets and to people and and how the, he had given them peace afterwards. So not only was so during this time, as, as Jesus is walking on, on the water, not only is Jesus defi uh, defying every physical law of nature by walking on water, but he was also essentially telling them the words God spoke to Isaiah in chapter 41, verse 10. In that verse, this is what God says. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Again, what we see here was Jesus manifesting his deity through word and action. He was revealing himself as God, as that second person of our Holy Trinity. Wow, again, what an amazing sight. What, you know, would have been something just amazing to see, I think. And again, I don't, I can't begin to tell you that I, I can't tell you here that I would, I would have reacted any different than the disciples, but man, again, just to see that. That would have been just a, a close second to actually the, tr the transfiguration we read about in the mountain when Jesus revealed his glory to three other, to three other of his disciples. Now it was also at this moment that according to Matthew 14, 28 to 31, that Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water to meet Jesus. And that story is probably one of the most well-known stories um, in the Bible, where Jesus got out of the I mean Peter got out of the water to meet Jesus. And many of you guys again know what the result happened, what, what happened there. what I want to mention is that when I gave the introduction, when I originally started this, this gospel, the Gospel of Mark, I gave an introduction. One of the things I mentioned was that Mark had either penned this gospel from the direct teachings of Peter, or he had written it from memorizing Peter's account after Peter had died. It's believed um, by many scholars, um, Bible teachers, that Peter may have left out the story because he didn't want to be exalted for walking on water or being humbled for sinking in it. Now again, if this is the story that Mark got directly from Peter, then you can see that. I mean, it, 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 make, it, it, it makes sense. You know, maybe this is one of those stories that 
Peter may have been not may have not been fond of. And it was he was doing so good at first, you know, he was walking and keeping his focus on on Jesus and then he starts to sink. He starts to fall into that water and he begins to panic and he feels like he's gonna drown. Until Jesus finally grabs him. I know I you know it's not one of the stories I like to I don't like to tell those kind of stories of me walking faithfully and keeping my eyes focused on the Lord and all of a sudden I begin to wander and look away. It's not a story that I'm fond of. I mean I will share it to help people and help them maybe go through help them go through whatever they're or help them um, to minister to them if they're going through a difficult time, maybe something similar. But I, I'm also not fond of telling those kind of stories. However, because of this incident with Peter, because this incident with so Peter, with Peter is so noteworthy, and so much can be learned from it. I honestly, when we do get to it, when we do get to that story in, in Matthew, I hope to be able to spend a whole entire Sunday with it. However, um, in order to keep the integrity of this gospel as it was meant to be studied and read. Taught. Um, I'm not necessarily going to be covering, besides what I already mentioned, I'm not going to be covering it in detail. But there's, there's again, a whole Sunday can just be dedicated just on that teaching alone. Now, if I did that, I would probably be up here for two hours. I don't know. I mean, I definitely would be going on and on. And I probably would be here until they, they were like, okay, you have to leave now. It's, it's time, you know, um, until they kick me out. I want to just uh, focus on what we see here. And I think there's already a lot here that um, that Mark shows us and that we could that are, you know, really uh, touched on. Now, after revealing himself to them in verse 51, we see a couple things happen. Jesus got onto the boat with them and the wind ceased. Now, I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be coming back to that point in just a minute. But the other thing that happened was the disciples, we see the disciples were completely astounded. Why? Why were they astounded by what they, by Jesus coming into the boat and, and ceasing the wind? Well, it wasn't necessarily that. According to verse 52, they had failed to gain insight, they had failed to gain proper insight that Jesus intended to show them with the five loaves and the two fish. They had failed to gain that proper insight. This was the reason why it says their hearts were hardened. You see, it wasn't that it wasn't that they um, that they didn't have a sincere love and appreciation for Jesus. It wasn't that at all. I, I, or else they wouldn't have followed him. They wouldn't have obeyed him, and they wouldn't have. Um, they would have, you know, this is 12 main disciples. You would have seen them falling by the wayside one by one. And, and they did. They loved them. And they did appreciate. They, they, they would see these miracles. And wow, you know, Jesus, this is an amazing guy. But it wasn't that. It wasn't, it wasn't that they didn't have a love and sincere. It was, they didn't have a sincere love towards Jesus. Rather, their hearts hadn't softened enough to see the divine nature of Jesus that miracle of feeding all those people. Their hearts had to soften to see Jesus as the Son of God. Had they understood, had they understood that fact that Jesus is the Son of God who has power over all creation, they wouldn't have been shocked. They wouldn't have been terrified about seeing Jesus walk on the water. They, they, their reaction would have been like, Praise God, praise the Lord. They, they, you know, they, they would have glorified him. See, they, they just they weren't grasping it yet. And we'll see later on um, that it, it, it wasn't until, again, after his death, that they finally understood. They finally they went back to every single thing Jesus taught them and every single thing that they went through with Jesus that they finally but yes, 
just say that's why it says in their hearts no more. They just it hadn't been softened. Now I want to I want to spend a quick minute sharing with you an important principle from Jesus getting into the boat with his disciples. Friends, it's one thing to be aware of God's presence during a stormy trial, but it's completely another thing for him to get into the boat with you. What I mean is that we sometimes make the mistake of understanding that Jesus Christ is there with us, and he's, he's there with us during these difficult circumstances. He's, he's, he's walking with us, and we know that. And there's, no, and there's actually nothing wrong with that, because it does, it brings comfort. However, the problem is that we don't allow him to come into those circumstances to calm them. You see, when we do this, when we don't allow him to come into the boat and calm these circumstances, we deny Jesus the opportunity to finish what he intended to accomplish in sending us into that storm. He doesn't, he's not able to finish it. He's like, he's there again, passing by. He won't even let me in. Let me, I want to finish this work that I'm trying to do with you and calm the storm, but I just have to come in. And again, our problem is that we, we keep working and we're scared and we're terrified and, 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 and we, we pray and, Lord, I, just be with me and give me the comfort that I need and, and we don't ask Jesus, come in and take care of this situation for me. Take care of it. And that's what he wants to do. I, when he does this, again, that's when he reveals something amazing, something glorious about who he is and that's when you begin to that's when that development comes. And that's when we begin to grow. And that's when he shows us the lessons that he wanted to show us during, as he put, when he put us into those storms. You know, he's, he's there. He's always been there. Now just let him in so that he can bring you the peace and the calm you've been desperately seeking. I want to finish this chapter by reading another type of manifestation that took place. Let's finish up chapter, I'll read these three verses. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and breached and beached on the boat. As they got out of the boat, many people, people immediately recognized them. They hurried throughout the vicinity and began to carry the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he would go into villages, towns or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might just that that they might touch just the tassel of his robe. And everyone who touched it was made well. In verses 53 to 56, what it shows us is how people's faith in Jesus manifested into miraculous now it's believed, I'm going to bring up the map again, it's believed, let me show you where I'm talking about now. It's believed that due to the storm, the boat went off course, and instead of going to Bethsaida, they ended up in Gennesaret, right here. So you see that they were complete, they went completely off course. But you know what, God had a plan. I mean, obviously, you know, God does an amazing work. Wherever he went, wherever Jesus went, it was always a need. So it didn't really matter if, if the wind blew them here or here or wherever. You know, I mean, it's, we knew that wherever Jesus went, something amazing was going to happen. And that's what happened. They went to Gennesaret. Instead of heading out to the Basadi area, they went to Gennesaret. And again, not that it really, really mattered because wherever there were people in need, Jesus was there to minister to those needs. There was always people in need everywhere. And there still is. And once again, as they got off the boat, people recognized Jesus and brought him all the sick. Wherever he went, we're told wherever all these towns, villages, where in the in the country, wherever he went, they would bring him the sick. 
just from everywhere. Again, regardless of the town where he visited, there were always people bringing, bringing sick people to him. The faith these people had in Jesus was so deep that they begged him that they might just touch the tassel of his robe. Their deep and profound faith in Jesus, in Jesus, not the tassels, not anything else, but just in Jesus, the tassel was just a, an instrument. It was just a tool, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't even the point. It was a faith they had in him. It was clear and evident by the healings they received when they touched him. And this is a quick summary, I mean, of, of the, min, the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. I believe, um, I think as he moves forward, we start getting more into um, the middle of his ministry and what was happening there, and then eventually his, his death. But you can see here that wherever he went, he healed. What we see here is an, ex an amazing example of faith by those who recognized who Jesus was and went out to see, went out to see him. This is the kind of faith that believes in Jesus, that believes that Jesus has the power to heal spiritually and physically. It's the faith that says, Lord, I'm broken. I'm begging you. Let me just touch the tassel of your robe. Let me just touch you. And I will be made heal. And those, you don't know how many times I've prayed the same thing. And I'm just broken, Lord. Let me just touch you. And I will be made well. In, my, in, in, in his own way, and only the way that I understand it, I did. We, we, we connected, and I, I was. I was healed. I was made well. And it's also a faith that absolutely trusts that, absolutely trusts that in the love and compassion of Jesus, he will heal you. You see, a heart that is broken, humble, and surrendered will never, ever be rejected by Jesus. If you come to him, surrendered, broken, with that heart, and tell him, Lord, heal me, fix me, I'm sick, I, I'm, I'm this, all this, he will, he will open, he will come and, and, and heal you. He won't reject you and say, you know what, you had your chance, and you know, I, you know, I, I called you back in 1999, you know, and you said, yeah, and you rejected me, and then I called, or I called you so many times, and I called out to you, and you didn't, no, you had it, he, he's not like that. He sees your heart, and he knows what's going on inside of you, and he's waiting again. He's waiting for you to have that humbleness, that brokenness. That's when he can do the most work in your life. As I close, I want to remind you of some important details that we covered this morning. Here are the, just as a okay, way, way of reminder, here's some, some of the main ones. The importance of, one of them is the importance of prayer when we're physically exhausted. Don't forget that. Spend some time doing that. Another one is, God sends us into storms to develop a deeper and stronger faith in Him. Third point to cover was the importance of allowing Jesus to come in and finish the work he intended to accomplish when he sent us into that storm. And finally, we saw that Jesus was able to accomplish what Jesus was able to accomplish with a heart that is broken, humble, and surrendered to him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you have a Savior in Jesus who loves you, who knows you, and always has your best interest in mind. He desires to transform you into the person God created you to be. However, He can't heal and transform. He can't do that for you if you don't have a heart for Him. That's why it's so important that we just read the, the gospel and, and understand the gospel exactly why Jesus Christ came and died 
and why he had to rise and rise from the grave after, grave after three days and be taken up to heaven. If you truly understand that, man, it, it does, it transforms you, it changes you. You have a more deeper understanding of, uh, of, of, of God and, and as I, I, that's one of the things I was thinking about as I was worshiping as <clears throat> you transformed me and every time I again I begin to think about that it, it, it does it, it affects me and I'm like thank you so much if you don't have that if you don't have that appreciation again I, I urge you and I ask you just to examine your heart and come to him in brokenness come to him Father, through your word here, you've given us so much to, to chew on, to dwell on, to just to think about, Lord. Sometimes we neglect to see, to just spend time with you in prayer. We sometimes forget to allow you to come into the boat and take care of whatever difficult situation we're going through. But because of your word today, Lord, we are reminded of how important that is. Lord, I ask that you touch every single person here. They may be able to come to you in the same way as all these people brokenness and in humbleness. Lord, transform these lives that are seeking to be transformed. Again, reveal yourself. If there's anyone who can just be listening and hasn't and surrender, I urge you just to, just, just to pray, cry out to God to forgive you of your sins. And watch him, and he will be faithful to forgive you of your sins. Do, the, do that just in the quietness of your heart. Wherever you're at, receive him. to walk faithfully in you as we be comforted by you and show us. Keep showing us. Help us help us to understand more and more who you are. Bless everyone here. Bless their week.